Welcome to the Scoop World Order. Happy Thursday. March Madness is in full swing. Uh, we have a huge practice report from today on BuckeyeScoop.com. Our members got to read it uh, hours ago. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we saw, what we've heard. Uh, getting a lot of intel from inside the Woody Hayes over the last few days. Who's looking good? Uh, who's in the quarterback hunt? Offensive line nuggets. And uh, obviously the phenom that is Jeremiah J.J. Smith. We're going to get into all of that. Michigan, another massive screw up. Um, Hunting for another new coach. Uh, it seems like every week they're, they're looking for a new coach. Uh, so we're going to get into that as well. And we're going to take your super chats. Uh, again, we appreciate those super chats. Those go right into our pay it forward fund. We've signed up a ton of new members uh, that are veterans. And also, this is a good time to thank all of our veterans, our first responders, our police officers, fire department. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Uh, you know, paramedics, all of you guys. Thank you guys for uh, serving us and taking care of the community. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, it's been a fantastic program. It's been awesome meeting a lot of you and uh, speaking with you guys on the phone. So we appreciate all that you guys do. Uh, and we, uh, the Pay It Forward program is a great way for you guys to enjoy BuckeyeScoop.com uh, as a nice gesture from our uh, our membership base. So thank you all for contributing to that. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, uh, click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. Uh, those three things have helped this channel grow uh, in a very massive fashion. It's, the, the growth is unbelievable. Um, especially in, in this, uh, arena, uh, just crushing basically everybody with our robotic growth. So thank you so much again. Uh, it's all cause you guys, we have a great community on here. Uh, we have a great community on BuckeyeScoop.com. And if you haven't taken the leap to join BuckeyeScoop.com during spring ball, it's probably the best time of the entire year to join because we have a ton of content flowing in from the Woody Hayes for all of the biggest Ohio state supporters in the world. And if you're listening to the show, that means that that is you. So as always, Thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. This is going to be a huge show tonight because you guys make it one. Make sure you guys shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. I love to see where you guys are watching from each and every night. Uh, but we're going to get right into this practice report because this thing was a monster. Uh, Nevada, uh, you have some sources at the WAC today watching practice, uh, spirited practice. They're in pads now. Uh, no more pillow pads. These guys are getting after it pretty hardcore. A lot of movement up and down the depth chart for guys. Uh, the youngest freshman ever to lose his black stripe happened today uh in terms of he's been here for since january it's week two of spring ball and his stripe is already off uh in jj smith freak show big friend of buckeye scoop big south Florida express kid uh what were some of the top level things that you gleaned uh when you talked to your sources that were at practice today so much to unpack man what a day the um look you always worry about overhyping a kid. And and I I do worry about that with JJ because I, we've I've seen JJ play. I've seen JJ play in seven on seven. I know the kid. And it, it seems like the, the the hype train has just gone crazy on him. So I, I'm always a little, you know, jaded, a little protected before I go out there and let's have another JJ Smith. You know, JJ Smith is really good update, but boy, he's really good. <laughs> he was really good. And uh, you just continue to tear it up, continue to take care of his business. Just really, the other players are really kind of in awe of the kid. And like I said, I worry about overhyping, but with JJ, you know something, I'm just not worried about it. He's worth every bit of the hype. Um, you'll all see it soon enough. Uh, what a great kid. Had his black stripe removed today. The fastest, I believe, ever the fastest after four practices that's ever happened at Ohio State. Kind of tell you kind of the rare error that he was in. And um, you know, just you know, had a virtuoso practice, kind of turned up at three or four touchdowns today, and uh, just turning guys around left and right. Um, can't say enough good things about JJ Smith, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention my. I always get a guy. I remember talking about Mitch Rossi a while back, and I remember first time we're talking about Mitch Rossi, and you're like, "Who the heck is Mitch Rossi?" It's like Mitch Rossi, and Mitch Rossi. Was a guy that you know was was a a mighty contributor to the Buckeyes. A guy that was they put him out there in key spots and key situations, and I just love those stories of those underdogs, those guys that kind of come from nowhere, kind of come up there, kind of do their thing. And um, to me, those are the that's the very very best of college football. Well, I've got another one of those names for you, and this is a kid named Brennan Schramm, uh, number thirty four, with two players lost their black stripes today. One was J.J. Smith, one was Brennan Schramm. Brennan is from Medina, played uh, with Drew. He's asked my dude Aller 
Um, was two times all state, put up some really gaudy numbers, got some great track numbers, but is a preferred walk on at Ohio State. And let me tell you what, he did not look like a preferred walk on today. He caught multiple, I, I, I'm saying at least three touchdown passes today against a very, very, very good Ohio State secondary. Um, I, he's going to be a contributor. And I, I, I know that's crazy talk. And I know that's like, no way, Nevada. There's the, one, the wide receiver room's too loaded. We got too many five star guys. No way some Brennan Tram is going to come out there and contribute. I am telling you, he's going to be a contributor. He is a good player, good football player, smart kid, um, really gets after it out there. And, um, you know, you know we, when we talk about those super sleepers, like the kids that are like deep, 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 this is my guy. Brennan Tramp, remember that? Nevada Bucks said it first. Um, Lost his stripe today and, and couldn't be more excited about that. So that's a couple things in the wide receivers. Uh, just, I mean, so much. This this group is so freaking talented and in such great shape. It's just, you know, it's an embarrassment of riches. We really, you know, the the, the defensive secondary is looking great. The uh, the linebacker, the linebacker group, they were, they were really running the three linebackers out there. They were running C.J., and Sonny Styles flanked by, uh, you, know, you know, flanking Cody Simon. And, um, you know, the reports were mixed. The reports are that Sonny really is best when he's got his hand in the dirt, when he's, you know, on the, uh, the run blitzes, when he's going forward, when he's going backward, or when he's having to take a step back and he's having to read, he's not as good. And you know, Ohio State needs to, you know, kind of deploy him accordingly. Um, another guy at the linebacker group that just – it's really good. Just that another guy you don't really hear about a lot, but I'm telling you, pay attention to him. It's Gabe Powers. Gabe Powers having another, you know, taking another big step forward in terms of practice, really doing things right. Classic Ohio State linebacker and just does everything the right way. Um, offensive line looking good. They, they're moving Fryer inside. They've got Fryer playing guard now. You know, we've been talking about will he play tackle? Will he play guard? He was all Big Ten tackle last year. They like him at guard. They like him on the inside. They like him at right guard. They got Luke Montgomery at right tackle. And um, the other thing, your boy, you called this. This is one of your uh, your ones for the your bold predictions. Carson Hinsman, first team center, locking it down. And uh, you know, I mean, Seth's going to provide some depth. But you know, right now, you know, it's long, long, long way till uh till fall camp. Long way till we kick it off. But Carson didn't giving up a job. And Carson's looking good. So Carson Hinsman, your, your starting center right now. So um, offensive line playing, playing with some punch, using their hands a lot better, which, again, I know is music to the ears of uh, of old number 74 here, Burt Carton, um, because I know you've been calling for that. Uh, apparently that's been really looking good. Uh, just I mean, so much. Uh, I, I feel like I've been talking for half an hour, so I'll I'll take a break and, and I'll let you kind of jump in because uh, – I'm exhausted already by my report. No, it's good. Um, I'm going to shout out my boy Dwight Tackett from Portsmouth. Shout out to my Southern Ohio boys. You guys are always holding it down for Buckeye Scoop. We're going to have a meetup down there soon, so you guys better be ready. We're going to come down there, go to the river, have a nice lunch. Uh, that's always a blast down there. But I, you know, uh, guys like that, that, that come out of nowhere are kind of my favorite kinds of guys. Walk-ons that aren't promised anything. Um you know, it, it's almost like, well, it, it's not almost like, it is like you get uh, an extra fellowship. Like when you get a guy like Brendan Schramm, um, like a CJ Saunders type, uh, you know, we've had these guys step in, contribute. Mitch Rossi, again, you guys got to remember, Mitch Rossi was on the field for uh, the last offensive play before we attempted the ill-fated field goal against Georgia. He was our running back blocking for CJ Stroud along with Dewan and Paris Johnson and the crew like i mean so, so he was a walk-on so there's some walk-ons that should be scholarship players that work their way into being scholarship players that frankly outwork and outperform scholarship players because a lot of these walk-ons they show up and they've got a chip on their shoulder they feel like they're under recruited a lot of these kids are from ohio mitch rossi was not um but you know cj saunders was from dublin and uh Shrev is from uh he's from um drew Eller school uh, up in mentor and I, I, I just think that when you get um, you get these kids that want to be Buckeyes and they die to be Buckeyes and they're really good high school players, all of a sudden they show up at Ohio State and they're like, wow, like these guys really aren't that much better than me. You know, and again, some guys aren't. Like a guy like JJ Smith obviously is much better than 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 Brendan Schramm is. You know, he's got a lot higher NFL ceiling, the whole nine yards. But 
this kid can have a role. He can run down on kickoffs. He can cover punts. Like these are the kind of guys that these are the kind of guys that make your teams. You know, these are the kind of role players. Obviously, you got to have your superstars. Um, you got to have a superstar quarterback. You got to have a great running back with Trey Henderson. You got to have JJ receiver, uh, Jack Sawyer. You got you know, Caleb Jones. You have those guys. But you need role players, guys that are selfless, guys that aren't going to cry if they don't get the touches, guys that just want to do anything to get on the field and play. This is like Nate Ebner. Nate Ebner was a guy who was criminally underused at Ohio State, played scout team for me as a senior, and then he went on and played 12 years in the NFL, won Super Bowls for Bill Belichick, but he wasn't good enough to play at Ohio State, which again, is what it is. But you know, Mike Vrabel said to Bill Belichick, this kid is something else. And Bill Belichick said, screw it. Took him in the sixth round. Nate Ebner never started a single game on defense at Ohio State and was a sixth round draft pick, which is incredible. But Vrabes knew what he was talking about. And he called Bill Belichick, say, hey, you might want to look at this kid because he's going to be a monster. He's going to be another uh, Matthew Slater, uh, who's a core special teams guy who just retired for the Patriots. Uh, and Ebbs had a great career. I mean, he's a monster. But I am, um, the offensive line is interesting because I think that they're really, they're, 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 their goal, I, in my, heart of hearts at Ohio state is they want to develop these guys into not just national champions, big 10 champions beat Michigan, but they want to develop these guys into the highest caliber NFL players that they can become. So Josh Fryer, that means he needs to bump into guard. Josh has been dominating at guard. He's been fantastic inside great battles with Ty leak. Um, but Josh has had a great offense. I mean, he's strong as an ox. He's got long arms. He's got a lot of really good attributes working for him inside and he's good enough to play right tackle at, you know, a, a, a second or third team All-American level, All-Big Ten level. He was All-Big Ten last year, so he's going to only be better his his senior year. Plus, he's another year uh, removed from the ACL. But they're getting long looks at the tackles um, to see if any of them can pass block. Is it Luke Montgomery that can go out there? Is it George Fitzpatrick? Is it Tigra? Um, you know, because, again, like when you go out on that island, man, you got to go see JT and Jack, and you're not going to get any help. So they got to figure out if, if any of those guys can do it and – you know, I mean, when you got to play Jack and JT, like whoever you play in the regular season is going to be uh, a cakewalk after playing those guys all spring, all of fall camp. But it gives Ryan Day and Chip Kelly and Justin Fry a real good evaluation of who's the best guy because they're playing literally two of the best ends in the entire country. Two guys that wowed at Pro Day yesterday. Two guys that, you know, the first, second roundish type picks could both be first round picks um, if they have big seasons and test well at the combine. So, uh, I'm excited about it all. Um, uh, you know, I think that the quarterback position, I think Will Howard is going to end up you know, seizing the job. Uh, I think that, you know, from I, I talked to a really, really good uh, source, really good NFL source today. Um, he called me about some of the guys and I'm like, look, what do you think Will Howard? He's like, he's a horse. He's a monster, big, strong kid, likes to run it. Um, you know, he's got a good enough arm, but the guys he was thrown to aren't, he wasn't thrown to NFL guys last year. Uh, he didn't have NFL infrastructure around him last year. He does now. So, you know, I, I know that a lot of, a lot was made about the pro day throwing and Devin Brown might have a strong arm, and he probably does have a strong arm. But, you know, I care about who can move the offense and score touchdowns. You know, it's not – if it's about having a strong arm uh, playing quarterback, then Jamarcus Russell will be in the Hall of Fame right now, and he's not. I want guys that can move the offense. And uh, really, I want a guy that can rally, rally the troops. So who's the better leader? Is it Devin – is it uh is it Will Howard? So that's some um, something that Ryan Day and Chip Kelly got to evaluate every single day, and uh, I'm just really excited because I think I honestly got think this is the most talented team we've had since probably 15 or 19. Um, maybe not quite as top end as 15 because you know, we had JT coming back at quarterback, um, but Will Howard could be as effective as JT because again I don't need you to be the first pick in the NFL draft. I need you to be a guy that can go get five yards against Michigan and move the chains and, and win that game. You know, cause we've had guys that obviously, you know, CJ was fantastic, but we weren't able to beat Michigan these last few years. We need a guy that can go win that game. And Will Howard could be that guy. Cause again, you need a guy that can run it. Who's going to be selfless. And, uh, and again, I think that's going to be um, a, a kind of a killer, uh, a killer edge going uh, into at the end of November, Nevada, who else? Uh, cause obviously, Sawyer, Edric Houston. I think Edric, um, a guy I got a lot of was Kenyatta. Um, I talked to the guy who was at practice today, and Kenyatta is really, really turning up. And I don't think it's a coincidence when Edric Houston is behind you that you start turning up a little bit more and winning on the edge uh, in the pass rush. But uh, any other names? Well, I mean, here's a name you might not have heard of before, but there's a guy named Caleb Downs that's uh, a safety for us this year. 
and he's every bit as advertised. Just a ball magnet, like a guy that just he he just finds the ball. And there's there, there's guys that we've all seen at Ohio State that just have that knack. That just have a knack. And there's sometimes you put safeties back there and they never make a play. They go back and you know they'll jump on the top of the pile. They'll they'll, they'll run. They'll do whatever it is. And then there's other guys that are just always making plays. That are always around the ball. That are always creating turnovers. Always creating pass broken up. Um, creating havoc. Well, Caleb Downs is that guy. I mean, he is that guy. He, he he is so noticeable when he's out there that, you know, as good as the OSU defense was last year, we weren't getting anywhere near the kind of production that we're going to get out of Caleb Downs. This guy is the truth. The fact that we have him for two more years is, is I mean, it, it's literally insane. Uh, but, yeah, he definitely he definitely got some uh, – definitely got some run. We could talk about the quarterback position. It's definitely uh, – it's, it's Will and Devin. You know, you know, Devin does throw a better ball than Will, but Will gets it there. And, um, you know, those guys go back and forth. Will loves to run the football. His eyes light up when they call his number. Um, it, it was full pads. It was not a tackle to the ground. That was just thump practice. But Will likes to thump. Will likes to get out there and bang it up in terms of doing it. I think if you're going after that, I think it's Julian third. And then I think Lincoln fourth. And I think Ayers fifth. I think if I had, if I had to handicap it right now, that's kind of the way that I'm seeing it. Um, you know, still early, still lots of things to go, but I think, you know, that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned Edric, which was, you know, again, a, guy, a Mecca balling out, you know, really, really doing a nice job. Um, and I, I think that's all I got on the practice. I mean, that was, uh, it was quite a practice report, you know, lots of stuff kind of going on, lots of, you know, moving the, the running backs. Uh, the, the running backs, watching Trey and Quinchon out there together, you know, the guys that are there are just like, it's like unlike anything you've ever seen. Like you just, you just can't get used to seeing that much flash and dash together in the same backfield. And they said Dallin looked really good. Uh, they didn't mention Peoples, but they did mention Dallin. But those two uh, just, yeah, again, just jaw-droppingly good. First team All-American, second team All-American type of talent in the same Ohio State backfield. So when, when one of them goes out and the other guy goes in, there is not going to be any noticeable drop-off. It's just two guys that if they have any type of a crease, they are gone. And that's going to stress the defenses uh, big time because you know, Ohio State's going to have so many different ways that they can hurt you, including the quarterback run. So um, I feel like the Chip Kelly offense is getting ready to fully activate. So you're saying that in practice we're able to survive without Tony Alford being there is what you're saying? barely we're getting well it, it, was, it was funny I, I have to say i did ask the question i'm like what's kind of the mood on people you know the coach you know the players about tony alford and they're like it's a big who cares <laughs> that's they said nevada like they're just like dude the, I, I i i won't say that they said that he was useless but I, it was pretty much they're like it it it, it doesn't matter they're, they they they've moved on they don't care Tony Alford is uh, like like yesterday's newspaper, and uh, you know, kind of moving on to the to, to the next ne the next chapter. But uh, you know, don't cry for me, Argentina. Yeah, I, I uh, I'm I'm over it. Uh, speaking of of dumb, Greg Shrugs, uh, the D line coach at Michigan, has resigned five days after being arrested in Ann Arbor for uh, an OVI or OWI or whatever they call it, Michigan DUI. Um, yeah, that's, uh, about a one month, one month tenure at Michigan, um, had a fat deal, 33 years old. He was double the legal limit. So he was split, um, Nevada. I don't know how it could get much worse up there other than with what's the impending, uh, hammer that's coming from the NCAA. But is it almost like sad at this point with Michigan or, I mean, cause I mean, this is like, this is insanity. Well, to me, I just, I just like. I just kind of the only part I chuckle about. I don't chuckle about anybody getting you know a drunk driving thing or the the sickness that is alcoholism. But the fact that Sharon Moore and the Michigan fan, the stupid Michigan fans, were like, "We've got the dream staff. This is the this is the perfect, the most perfect staff of all time." Except, except for the guy with the multiple D DWIs, and he he was a, a train wreck coming up there. And so this was kind of predictable. He lasted what ten days or twelve days or whatever it was. And fell asleep in the middle of an intersection at 3:30, uh, 
with his car on, which is never a good look. Um, there's no real good way to explain that one away. Um, so, yeah, just the, the dumpster fire that is Michigan just continues to burn, and, and I'm here for it. And the fact that they got Alford is their, like, big – that was their big coup. Oh, we got Tony Alford. I mean, welcome to mediocrity, man. And Tony, he personifies that. So um, he, he, he'll, be, he'll be great up there, and he can, he can complete their new – greatest of all time dream staff and uh he'll fit right in yeah i think it's gonna be uh it's gonna be fascinating um like i said i you know again i'm not trying to make light. obviously an ODI, wi is a, a terrible event but you know i mean the guy um you know he just got there you know wink martindale who's the guy i was with in denver when i played for the broncos is he's became the highest paid coach in uh college football as a coordinator he's making like i think two four two five over three years so Good luck. Uh, I, I like I said, if there's ever a year where we got to get these guys, it's this year, and I think you know the NCA hammer is going to come. It's going to be awesome. Really excited about it. Uh, but this is the last I'm going to talk about Michigan on the show, just because they make me sick, and we're getting a bunch of super chats, so we're going to start uh, cranking through these. Appreciate you guys as always. Uh, thank you for getting these super chats fired up again. You guys make this a huge show, so thank you guys so much, uh, Adam. Uh, thanks for the deuce, Kirk. Nastiest fans you encountered on the road, and I'll include Nevada on this, but I'll go first. You know, it's probably Penn State. That's probably why I hate Penn State so much. Is their their fans were just atrocious. Um, Iowa's were terrible too. We played there in 04 and we got absolutely annihilated. Uh, then we went out there in 06 and smashed them, which was great. Uh, but Penn State's fans were just like drunken morons. Uh, when we played out there in 05. Um, it was a night game. Uh, it was kind of like the re revitalization with Paterno. It was it was terrible. And and again, I got to experience it firsthand because I, I got my knee ripped up, uh, tore my MCL on a field goal block, which was terrible. Uh, and I had to walk to the training room. So it was just an MCL. So I could walk on it, but I couldn't play on it because the knee wouldn't stay in the socket. So I couldn't get in a stance without my knee slipping out of the socket. Um, so I couldn't brace it. I tried everything I could, but I couldn't get back out there and we ended up losing, which killed me. Um, but we played Penn state and I had to do that fateful walk from our sideline. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Penn state to the locker room, the locker rooms, the road locker rooms at Penn state are probably they're up there with Purdue. Is it like the worst locker rooms in the entire country? Like there's the big 10 has no standard for locker rooms. Cause like the, the Penn state is like, you get like a hook on the wall for your gear and you get a terrible little shower and and you walk like through this, like it's like the WWF in the eighties where they have like those steel barricades that, the, you know, when the guys would walk out from the, the blinking WWF sign thing, they'd walk down the little uh, thing to the ring. That's what it's like. And, and you walk through there and there's fans on both sides. They're just dead drunk. They're nasty. They say the nastiest, most vile stuff to you. And honestly, like, I love that stuff because I'm like a lot closer to being like Ric Flair than I am, you know, one of the, the baby faces and wrestling. Like, I love being the bad guy. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. So they said all this stuff and like, I loved it. Going out to warm ups was amazing. I had a broken foot uh, in 05. And so they shot me up with Tordal and it felt amazing because my foot went numb. And I was actually like, I wasn't in pain because in practice, they wouldn't shoot it up because obviously you can't shoot up every day. But I go out, I get that that thing, man. They shoot my foot up, and it felt amazing. I was so excited to play, and it was loud, and it was the greatest atmosphere I've ever seen for college football. Um, even though we lost, it was insanely loud. Um, but then when I got hurt, I had to walk back through the the maze of people, and I was with uh, uh, Doctor Kading, who's still the team doctor, and Doug Callen, who's still the head trainer. It was those two and me walking back so they could check my knee out. And I, I knew I was done. I knew I couldn't play. Um, but they were so nasty. And, like, it was, you know, again, I love playing on the road. Like, I like playing at the road more than I like playing at the horseshoe. The only thing I like more about the horseshoe is that when I'm done, I get to go home and go see my family and have dinner and, you know, go have a couple Crown and Cokes. But, like, when you're on the road, everybody hates you. And I was like, this is a great, like, you don't need any motivation. You don't need to listen to no music. You don't need to do nothing. Because when everybody boos you, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And when you get to shut all their fans up and send them home, it's it's literally the greatest thing in the world. Like winning up at Michigan was more fun than winning than beating Michigan in the horseshoe because you get to send all of their fans home sad. And it's there's nothing that I've ever loved more than than sending home a bunch of people who paid a bunch of money sad. It's, it's the greatest feeling in the world for my money. Nevada, who are the nastiest fans that you've encountered? Because uh, you've gone to games, you've been to all the stadiums. Where's the nastiest fans at? 
Uh, 03 Wisconsin night game. That was the oh, worst. Oh, God. You were at that? Oh. Yeah. That was so bad. So bad. Oh. So bad. Uh, I never will return. Will never return. And I'm a Packer fan. So I'm, I'm like, you know, hey, I'm going to go up there and be in Wisconsin and the Cheeseheads and everybody would be nice. And we'll be, no, man, big mistake. And we kept a low profile. We're not like, it's not like I'm dressing up like Buckeye guy or something like that yeah. and doing the thing or big nut. You know what I'm saying? Like we're kind of yeah. keeping ourselves low key. I had little kids with me at the time, like really little. And um, little, little funk. Little, no, little funk wasn't even born. This was like little Grayson. Oh no and, way! And, wow. And they like and they like ripped a button off of his shirt. Literally ripped oh, the button God. off of his jacket. So just like you know, and he starts bawling, and he's four. And so you know, like it's just. I mean, it was it was just nothing about that was good. And it's like you. It was one of those ones you don't dare make a stand where it was me and I had my six year old daughter, my four year old son, and about fifty drunken Wisconsin fans. And I'm just like, this is probably not the time. <laughs> this is, but but it was tempting. But it was indeed tempting. I um yeah I that that was the game where again when you don't travel when you're not on the travel squad and you get to spend uh, the game in the dorms with a bunch of your homegirls and they're like. Aren't you on the team, Kirk? We thought you played football at Ohio State. Why aren't you there? I'll be there next year. I promise. None of us at redshirt because to to under to to explain redshirting to like an eighteen year old freshman college girl, it's like it's like explaining like quantum theory or something. They don't understand how you can be on the team, but you're not actually at the game. So I had to like explain. Well, maybe next year I'll be there. And I was like, no, next year I'll be there. But like, I was I remember that, and I was like, and we just got punked. I just remember like Antosh Hawthorne and. It was funny because I had to block all those guys the next year, like because those guys all came back. All of our guys that played that game were gone, and then Antosh was back, and Erasmus James was back, and they smacked us in the horseshoe in 04 because we we sucked. We didn't have uh, our the good players playing yet, so uh, it was hard for us to compete against those guys because they were always the same team as the 03 team, except we lost all of our seniors and we were real young when we played them early in the year. Roger Smith, thank you for the deuce, JJ for a thousand. I'd love to see that prop bet because, you know, I mean, a thousand yards at Ohio State is really, really tough to do when, because we have, it's not because JJ's not talented. It's because there's so many mouths to feed. Uh, Amari Cooper impact as a freshman, Nevada OH. I O. I mean, I, I, again, I think the hardest part about predicting JJ for a thousand is there's just a lot of mouths to feed. Because again, is he the second best receiver? Is he better than Innocent Tate? Obviously, I'd, I'd, I'd venture to guess Emeka's number one. Um, you know, is Emeka durable enough to make it through the season? I mean, he's had some injury issues, but, you know, JJ for a thousand is a prop bet. I mean, I'd, I'd throw a little bit of money on it, but because I think that sometimes when there's some stuff going like that, if JJ starts off just ripping off yardage and killing it, like I think, you know, in, in, in Ryan Day's mad scientist brain and Brian Hartline's mad and Chip Kelly, how cool would it be? You know, again, because Brian Hartline's already the greatest wide receiver recruiting coach that's ever lived. But how cool to be to say, "Hey, we had a true freshman come up here and get a thousand yards in our offense." Like, do you want to come? Do you want to come play here, Jamie French, Vernell Brown? Uh, we, you know, your boy who's from South Florida Express. Because you guys are SFE, you guys could come up here and get a thousand yards next year if you're good enough. JJ was good enough. Um, but you know, like Brandon Ennis was the best receiver in the country two years ago, and he had you know, you know, what five catches last year, or so. A thousand yards is tall cotton for a freshman wide receiver, but if anybody in the history of the program could do it, it's JJ. But again, you got to feed Quinshawn, you got to feed Trey, you got to feed Mecca, Innis, Tate. So, and then you know, if any of the other ancillary, if Jaden Ballard, you know, which you are basically I think I've kind of given up on, uh, you know, Kyrian Graves, all these other guys, like if any of those guys can do anything, ah. Uh, but I mean, JJ is clearly the most talented freshman we've ever had. Uh, at wide receiver, and I think that um, the only thing that would hold him back is just he's not going to get a volume to get to a thousand. Nevada, am I right? Wrong? Are you indifferent? Because um, he could do it if he was at an offense that didn't have the best wide receiver room in the country. Then maybe, but you look at like what Marvin Harrison did and uh, Garrett Wilson. Like I mean, it's really hard as a true freshman to get to a thousand. Uh, but your thoughts on that, Nevada? Oh, I think you kind of nailed it with if anybody could do it, it's JJ. I mean, no. you know, the good news is some of those other guys are slot guys, and so they're not really playing the same spot that, that JJ is. I mean, JJ is just that – he's just that Marmaduke, man. He's that big old guy that you just put out there, 
and send him deep and and, and hit him with the. I mean, uh, so he's going to get his. Will he get a thousand? Given the the expanded playoff and the season, I'm going to say yeah. I'm going to say yeah. He's going to get a thousand uh, for this year. But like you said, that it, it the only thing that's going to hold him back is just is so many talented players got to distribute the ball around, got to stay healthy. But if he does all those things, I I think he'll I'll think he'll get a thousand comfortably. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's going to be awesome. And again, he is he's all that. And uh, again, the guys I talked to that have coached him the last few years, all he wants to do is play football. That's like music to my ears. Uh, Sheriff Steel Workshop, my man. Thanks for the deuce. Thanks for being an ultra member. Thank you for the knife. I say it every single night, but the knife is super amazing. If you guys haven't followed Shof Seal Workshop on Facebook, please do it. He is growing his streaming. If you want to watch him bang on some really hot metal with a hammer, it is really uh, compelling stuff, especially if you buy something from him because we've had people order knives and swords off of him from Buckeye Scoop. So, hey, you want a really cool gift? Have him fashion you a sword just like you're uh, one of the, the knights uh, from Game of Thrones. Or you're one of the king's men. Um uh, can't say, uh, just want to say Michigan sucks. You're the best one, man. Uh, appreciate you as always. Ref 49. Thank you for the 10 Springfield. Is this Dayton Springfield? A uh, great part of the world. I love, uh, I love getting over there. Um, I think Braxton's from there. Uh, how much of the first half play selection is intended to identify the best receiver matchups in the second half? Who threw the three TDs to the walk on? Um, God, I don't know if we'll know that one. Uh, cause I would imagine it, it, it had to have been one of the young guys, I would guess. Cause I'm, I'm guessing he's probably not running with the ones, maybe not even the twos. Um, oh, the first part of your question is how much of the pl- first plus play selection is intended to identify? Well, I mean, I think the wide receiver matchups, you can, you can identify those in the first drive. Um, you know, cause a lot of times if you want honesty, you go ask your kids, Hey, is this guy good? Is this guy real? Are you shredding him? Um, cause these guys can know, even if they're not getting the ball, if they just run their routes, if they're getting separation, uh, and winning, just winning their routes, then they can say, yeah, this guy can't, this guy can't check me. There's no chance like run this route, run this route. Like that's, that's where I think we're getting better at is that these guys are really communicating with Brian and Ryan day. And I think Chip Kelly will have a nice ad and they say, Hey, this guy can't get, ke- he can't check JJ. And you know, Ryan day, if there is blood in the water, he is a great white shark. And again, the greatest example of that ever was that 18 Michigan game uh, where Dwayne Haskins threw for about 8,000 yards on that one cornerback who they just kept finding where he was and they threw drag routes against them all day and it was the killing fields. Paris, Paris Campbell still running. Um, but I think they do that pretty quick. Uh, Nevada, I'm guessing you're not going to know because again, when we get these reports, like we don't get like a full, it's not like you get like a box score, like a game. We just get, hey, this kid scored three TDs, but um, you're not going to know that part, uh, correct? Yeah, all I'd heard is that they were rolling the quarterbacks like crazy. Like it was just like one after another. It was just like one. So it it didn't sound to me like this was like, hey, Brennan, get out there with the fifth string guy against the fifth string. I'm like this sounded like this was like a rotation. But I but I don't know. Like you said, I don't have a practice box score or a thing. You know, play chart type of thing. But it didn't sound like it was just kind of a random end of the day. It was like impressive kind of stuff so don't know who did it but it, it was impressive yeah i um that's just how that works and um but yeah in general um they identify the the, the matchups like right away and, and a lot of times you can identify just watching a film going into the game but then you can verify it in the game and say yeah this guy is not real he's not gonna be able to check mecca or jj or ennis or whoever we have out there tate obviously what is his story thank you for the five nevada oh i o uh with modern analytics and assistant coaching hire statistically what is the gauge to compare the nick Cisciano and connor stallions eras i don't even know what that means but it is kind of funny um obviously you're a historian for bringing up uh nikki and uh, connor stallions um <laughs> assistant coaching hires. i mean sis was you know like again i'm not gonna everyone likes to like just destroy nick Cisciano, but like you know Joe Daniels, God rest his soul, was one of the greatest human beings I've ever met in his life. Great wife. Daughter was a cheerleader at Ohio State. Nicest human being I've ever been around. Really good football coach. Obviously, you know, he succumbed to cancer. And, uh, you know, Nick was a QC. Trestle elevated him. Um, Nick had, like, quadruplets or something with his wife. And 
they don't, you know, your trust hired him because he already kind of knew the role. And, you know, trust was kind of the quarterback's coach. I mean, trust was the quarterback's coach. So it was a lot like, it was a lot like Ryan day, honestly, like he kind of doted over the quarterbacks and Joe Daniels was kind of the overseer of the, of the, uh, he was kind of like the co-offensive coordinator of the not in title. Um, cause he worked great with bowls. Uh, you know, bowls was the OC, but you know, in terms of the throw game, he got a lot of help from Daryl Hazel and from Joe Daniels and from later on, Nick Siciliano. Um, but yes, this obviously was a much better coach than Connor Sanders, who never was an actual coach. But uh, I think that's the gauge to compare. Um, this was better than Science. Nevada, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, kind of a confusingly word question. But um, yeah, look, Nick got a lot of grief. But then when Nick left Ohio State, it's like he ended up like selling copiers or something. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing or something like that. But it wasn't like coaching at USC or something like that. So sometimes, you know, play, you know, they always say fans criticize the coaches too much, but sometimes the criticisms are warranted. And uh, I, I think in Nick's case, uh, yeah, it, it, it probably was. In, in Connor Stallion's case, um, hey, we're still going to be we're going to be talking about Connor Stallion's is going to be remembered. He's going to be remembered as the guy that brought down the Michigan program. So uh, we're still going to be talking about him for years. So we, uh, in, in some ways, we have to thank him. And he'll be he'll be played a significant role in Ohio State lore. You know, it'll always be a the Connor Stallions thing. So thank thank you, Connor, if you're listening. We appreciate you. I uh, totally agree. Paul Lewis, Scoop Hall of Famer. Uh, thank you for the hundred. Appreciate you, brother. Hi, Ohio seven seven one five. Tora, Miss Kim B, and the Scoop family, Kirk in Nevada. Uh, this is a great question. Also, thank you for the hundred. Paul's exceptionally generous. Thank you so much. Who do you consider the greatest walk-on of all time? Ooh, is this Ohio State or is this ever? Um, gotta be, gotta be Ohio State. Yeah, it's, it's gotta be Ohio State because otherwise I'm saying Aaron Rodgers. But um, Nevada, I'll let you go first. Uh, who do you consider the greatest walk-on of all time? Well, I think there is one answer here, which would be Terry Glenn. I think Terry Glenn is considered technically to be a walk-on. At Ohio State, that's always kind of the the meta answer uh, in terms of that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if he was like a true walk on, but T- Terry Glenn would be uh, would be my pick. But I mean, heck, you know, not talking about the greatest, but just recent. Xavier Johnson last year was a great contributor, captain, walk on. You played with Mike Knee. I I love Mike Knee. I thought he was a you know terrific guy. That you know Tank Whaley, um, uh, Mitch Rossi. Uh, I, you know, I mean, there's just been so many, you know, walk on stories, you know, why we don't have the great, like Rudy did, And I, I don't know if you knew this. Do you know that Gene Smith was the guy that was subbed off the field for Rudy Rudiger when he went out there? I don't know I if mean, you knew you, that or not. You say that every, you say that to me like every day now, it's like a running joke now. <laughs> it's I, not, I, it's I, true. I never, it's I, true. I never would have guessed. Cause you don't know. Cause you don't believe that. And so I'm, I'm going to keep telling you Rudy Rudiger. The guy he played for was Gene Smith. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what that means. I'm not sure what the symbolism of that is, but it happened. So that was uh that was it. But uh, no. The I, I hope Brennan Schram turns out to be like a great walk-on story at Ohio State because uh, I I love it. Like I said, college football with the kind of the commercialization, the expansion of the playoff, NIL, the portal. There's a lot of stuff about college football that's changing, and, and I don't. I, I you know, it, it, there's some good things about it, some bad things about it, uh, but it certainly feels different. But walk-on stories are always feel good. Um, guys playing it for the most, the purest of reasons, and uh, I know I'm going to be rooting really hard for number 34 uh, all this season. I hope he gets some playing time. Um, I got a guy. I got a couple guys. Uh, I had to look his resume up. Still playing in the NFL. He is on year 13, uh, 20, 2011 to 2023. Two-time Pro Bowler, um, 36 years old. Jake McQuaid, walk-on. Um, well, long snappers don't count, man. Long, don't, don't dude, if you're, long. Dude, dude, if you're a Pro Bowler in the NFL, that counts. I mean, if you're a Pro yeah. Bowler, Super Bowl champion, like that's... That's pretty good. I mean, I mean, dude, if you're a walkout and you, and you last, he's 36 years old, still playing in the National Football League. Like, I don't care if you're a long snapper or a kicker. Like, that pension is going to be amazing. And I would bet 
ninety percent of the people listening to this podcast probably has no idea who Jake McQuaid is. So that those are like just those are the it's kind of like when we talk about Brendan Schramm, like the guys that make the core of your roster up, like guys like that. You know, I mean, he he caught on uh, with the Rams, was there for a long time uh, with Zerline, went to the Cowboys for a couple years with the Lions. Now that's pretty good. Uh, Tyler Whaley was another one who's my favorite because he was in my recruiting class and. It was, uh, he's an Ironton boy and he is one of the greatest kids I've ever been around. Probably my favorite, you know, more, he's just a kid that tough as nails, moved to fullback his senior year. Um, you know, it was hard. Cause like, you know, when you go from offensive line doing conditioning to running back conditioning, that's really hard. And tank, like that's what it was like. Tank Whaley tank. Well, you know, we, we probably he had to get down to like two sixty. And I mean, dude, like making the times for running back work is really, really hard. And he had to do it. He was running next to Beanie Wells and Boom Heron. And he was running when, you were, when he was running with the centers and, and the O line, like, you know, he'd scorch everybody because he only weighed like 270. So, I mean, he, of course, he's not going to outrun all the guys that are 305 and 310 and 350 and some of the fat guys we had. Uh, so, Tank's another really good one. Um, but obviously, like, like, like Terry Glenn. Just you know, winning the Blitnikoff. I mean, that obviously is the greatest walk-on story in the history of Ohio State football. But we've had some really good ones. And again, finding a good walk-on was something that Urban really rewarded uh, because again, it was uh, it was like finding another scholarship. It was like finding an '86 scholarship, an '87 scholarship. When you find guys that can contribute on special teams, maybe contribute on defense, a, a kicker, a punter, a walk, you know, a, a long snapper. Like those are really valuable guys on your rosters because you only got 85 spots that are scholarships. So. You got to go find about 30, 35 uh, walk-ons to fill it out for practice. And, you know, good walk-ons, especially in the transfer portal era, are very difficult to find. Because a lot of these guys, like, if they walk on and they feel like they're going to have to play, they're going to bounce and go to a smaller school and go play. So uh, those are my picks. Uh, I'd love to hear you guys' picks in the chat as well. Um, Woody, the historian, thank you for the five. Another one. Nevada OH. I O. All right, Nevada, we get another one with modern analytics and assistant coach hires. Should the Nick Siciliano era exclude the Joe Bowserman era? Nevada, I'll let you have that because uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I don't know what the question I, is. I think Woody has been drinking tonight. I, that's that's yeah. my final answer is that Woody has been, has been hitting the. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Hit, has been hitting the vodka tonics tonight, which is good. I like I like me a good vodka tonic, and I think Woody's been kind of getting into it a little earlier tonight. And uh, maybe he'll like to phrase that thing in, in the form of a question later in the chat, and we can pick it out. And because uh, I'd like to answer it, but I'm just not even sure what I'm answering right now. I uh, I love it. I, I think it's hilarious. I mean, I, here's the thing: the problem with coaching is you can't exclude the bad years, and obviously that was the worst year in school history. Is 2011 when. You know, we had to start Joe Bowser, man. Then we had to play Braxton. So I've talked to Ed Nelson about that seven loss season. Like, so I don't think you can exclude it um, because your name's written on it. That was your position. And we just didn't have a chance. All of our best players were suspended and Urban Meyer was coming. And it was, it was a, it was like being in, it was like riding on the Hindenburg for a nice joy ride. Uh, it was about what that season felt like. So uh, it was not good, but thank you for the question. Thomas Taylor, I appreciate you, my man. I look forward to seeing you on the 13th, along with Andy Joe and your lovely wife. I think we're going to have a blast. Uh, Andy Joe Taylor is the official Buckeye Scoop country singer, so download her song now. It's actually a great song. I play it all the time on my Instagram story. Uh, is the People's Kid going to stay? As far as I know, but, you know, there's uh, been a little tomfoolery with his NIL stuff, but I think he's going to be fine. Um, but again, if we lose him, do I care? Not really. I love him. I think he's a great kid. I think he's a, he's an Ohio state kind of kid, great attitude, uh, exceptional talent. I think he'd be a monster in this offense. Again, I, I always think that like when people leave Ohio state, especially what, with the way the depth chart sets up with Quinshawn and Trey, both being gone after this year, you're absolutely crazy to leave. You know, Cause I mean, James Peoples could beat out Dallin Hayden next year and be the starting running back at the Ohio state in Chip Kelly's offense which could make you a Heisman like finalist. So for me, like if James leaves, it's short-sighted, it's stupid, but you know, I, I I've heard nothing that says he's going to leave. Um, I'm sure that he's probably a little upset about, about uh, 
Tony Alford being a ratchet and leaving the way he did. But that's just big boy football. You know, again, I always tell these kids, these coaches don't care about you at all. I mean, they, they lie and say they do, but the coaches are as faithful as their options. And uh, that goes right down the line. If, if Brian Hartline got offered the right job, he's gone. Fry, uh, basically all of them. So just, you know, pick the school you want to go to um, and hope that they hang out there. Because, you know, if someone comes along and offers Brian Hartline like a plum, if Clemson fires Dabo, and they offer Brian Hartline the job, like he's gone. He's not going to stay here and be the wide receivers coach anymore. So, and that's just the nature of the beast in coaching. You can't get too attached to these coaches because they're all trying to improve their situations. So Tony Alford did just that. He did it in a very ratchet way, which I think I always thought he was a ratchet anyways. And he's a terrible recruiter who had bad rotations. So um, whoever we hire next will be an upgrade over him. And I think James Peoples uh, is likely going to know that after about five minutes of talking to him. Nevada, is James Peoples going to stay? I think it's unknowable right now. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely one that we're keeping an eye on. You know, We definitely have the flashing yellow light. But let me just give you a little more on that. He was promised some stuff on NIL that has not been delivered to him. And whether that's Tony Alford's fault for not communicating that to the collectives or the collective's fault for not following through, um, there's a lot of finger pointing in terms of going, but that's the, that's the fact that that is one of the sources of discontent. Um, and you know, with him is that there were promises made, haven't been delivered and they need to get delivered on. So, uh, for any of the people out in the collectives, consider that a challenge, get the James people stuff done. Um, stop at the finger pointing, got to handle it with this kid. Because, you know, that's the, that's the dirty side of NIL that people don't really see because we see the stuff and the, the big stuff and the guys getting stuff done. But a lot of times with a lot of schools and a lot of places, and this is one at Ohio State, commitment made, hasn't been filled up, but got to take care of it, take care of your business. And um, I think a lot of that uh, unhappiness will go away. But um, it, it, it's there, it's been there, and it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh Thomas Taylor, another uh, thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my man. Michigan versus Integrity. I think he's talking about your company, in Nevada. What is the latest on? Was it U.S. Integrity? That's the name of the gaming company. U.S. Integrity. Yeah. Um, any update on that? U.S. Integrity is looking into stuff with Michigan. Not, nothing. Really, you got to Sam. Okay, let me. I'm going to let you guys in on a dirty little secret. Don't tell any of the Michigan fans this. Okay, so you can't. We cannot let this go outside of this chat. This is just going to be amongst the thousands of people that are on this chat right now. Twitter is for trolling, primarily trolling Michigan fans. So we're not going to break anything on Twitter. So if we're going to break anything, we're going to break it on BuckeyeScoop.com. Then we might bring it here to the podcast. We might discuss it there, but we're not going to break it on Twitter. So Twitter's mainly for trolling. Uh, U.S. In, U.S. Integrity is, is certainly a, a group that is engaged with the NCAA, engaged with the Big Ten, investigating uh, Michigan. Uh, not sure if I have anything more on that right now, but um, I, I have enjoyed the, the fact that Michigan fans are, 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 are triggered over that. So remember, Twitter for trolling. That's primarily what we do with that account. And it is, uh, it is really, really funny what we read on there. So, uh, shout out to, uh, Twitter, uh, Roger Smith. Thank you for being an ultra member. Thanks for the deuce. Nevada or Ross Bjork. Give you your plaque, AKA your sign back Nevada. OH. I O. I don't know. I want what my sign. Do? I want my, I mean, is, I want is, my it, sign. is it gone? I, is it under the ground? I don't, do I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. Here's the thing. Okay. I want you guys to know. I have one of my best friends in the world that lives in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm not going to name him, but his name rhymes with Burt Carton. And he could go by there and check to see if my signs are and take up do like a reconnaissance mission. Should I do a live by. stream like the like the Blair Witch Project? I'll just live stream he, the whole thing he, and then he oh. could he could do it. He's got this monster truck. He could drive on by there and That's check right. to see the signs there. But you know, I don't I don't really want to ask him to do that oh because that would be God. small. That would that would be petty of me, and I don't want to I don't want to do I want I don't want to put him out. But if he wanted to drive on by there when he's picking up chicken or something like that, you're, the next time you're, one of your chicken wing runs, swing on by there, check to see if the uh, sign's up, and we can get Operation Find a Bad Sign back up. But, but just putting that out there. 
my, my birthday's coming up. That's what I want for my birthday. That would be great. I, I, I mean, the one time I went I, there, the sign was not up. I looked everywhere for it. You're like, hey, can I you go see if my sign's want, up? And I was like, it's no I want my found. sign. I want my sign. Damn it. Well, if 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 your sign's not there, can I replace it with a sign that I'd want to have made? Yeah, yeah. I? yeah we do that. We'll, we'll put up like something advertising the Smash Burger at Buffalo Wild Wings or something like no, that. No, I'm going to put up a giant sign right outside the window that said, Scoop had it first. Oh, ah. that'd be, aw- that'd be so awesome. That when they, so that when all the pork rinds park and go into their uh, their meetings, they can see a giant Scoop uh, sign. That's wicked. Uh, oh, we do, love, we do love trolling <laughs> those guys. <laughs> Sorry, we're at home. Thanks for the, oh. uh, thanks for uh, doing our dirty work for us. Donald and Karen at Rossbeck, thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Appreciate you, my man. And thank you for being awesome on the message board. Uh, you guys have been great. Uh, thanks for the five as well. Uh, I think JJ is going to ball out and beat these corners like a red-headed stepchild. Wow. I can't think of any redheads that have gotten beaten up recently to what he hates about it. Can you? Nope. Can't think of a one. Not any. Not a one. Not it. Not a one, not a one. That strength <laughs> coach is undefeated. There's one, one and zero versus the coach. And... If Dagestan Poppy had to set a line on that fight, like, what do you think it would have been at? Like, could you have gotten good numbers on it or not? No, nah, no, nah, that would have been like a minus twelve. Or well, while we're, I, I, this is a perfect segue. I'm just going to tell you guys right now. If you're a gambler or if you like, man, we have a card coming up this week. There's UFC card coming up this weekend. Go to Dagestan Poppy, Dagestan, just like it sounds, and Poppy, P-A-P-I, Twitter. Click on the the MMA selections. We are very, very confident in our MMA selections for this weekend. I'm telling you, it's probably the most confident that we've been. You can look at the track record. Track record's up crazy. Um, But this weekend, we feel really, 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 really good about we didn't. We were no bet last weekend. So this isn't like every weekend we feel good. Last, Last weekend, we literally passed on the entire card. Because we, the, the card did meet our criteria this weekend, we have a lot of spots that we like. So if you like money and you have your little ch- thing there, Dagestan Poppy, check his Twitter out. Um, give him a follow if you can, but uh, check out check out his picks because uh, you'll you'll make money this weekend. I I, I I promise you. Yeah, I think um yeah it's been really good. If you guys uh, want to check his action, if you look at his Twitter, uh, he he tracks all his action for what? How long has it been Nevada? Has it been a year yet? Over a year? Oh no! Oh yeah, almost two years now. Almost two years of tracked action. So you can't you can't go backwards on that because once you lock it in, it's locked in, and it's just a method to say, "Hey, I'm I'm really cooking right now with uh, with some of these picks." Well, um, Nevada, these guys got a. I don't know if it's going to be a scrimmage, but traditionally in the spring on Saturdays they have a heavier practice, um, just because these guys are off Sunday, Monday, uh, they don't go back at it till Tuesday. Um, so I think they're going to get after it a little bit on Saturday. Um, again, cause I think they got to keep, they got to keep finding out who's the right guys and get them in the right chairs and get the wrong guys, you know, out of the picture, uh, pretty quick on the offensive line, uh, backup defensive tackles. I think are going to be evaluated. Who do you think needs to step up over the next week? Because again, you, we've got a lot of Intel. We've heard some good, some bad. Um, you know, and again, I'm not trying to you know say that if you say someone needs to step up, uh, it's because they've been poor, but who are some guys that need to hit another level in your opinion? Well, I mean, I'm looking at those interior defensive linemen, you know, the Ty Hamiltons, the hero canoes, the Ty Lick Williams, you know, I want to see how much push we get out of the interior guys. Let me tell you, Jack Sawyer is getting rave reviews right now. And I know Jack Sawyer was a guy that took a lot of abuse last year. And it seemed that when Jack and JT were getting abused, you and I were kind of on an island on the, hey, these guys don't suck. These guys, these guys really are good players thing. But Jack is looking bendy and bursty, um, which I know is music to your ears, uh, you know, heading into his senior year. And it's what you want to see out of your defensive ends as they kind of head into, you know, their fourth year and, you know, they're, they're upperclassmen. They're guys that you know didn't bolt right away as maybe kind of slightly unfinished products to the NFL. But, you know, I want to see Jack and JT dominate. And as much as I want to see our, our offensive tackles, you know, hold the line and, and do their thing and prove that they can pass block, man, I want to see our defensive tackles, our defensive line just take over the game and just dominate the way that I know they can, I, the, 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 the way that I know that they will. Love to see Kenyatta Jackson get on the action, Caden Curry. But, you know, Edric Houston, 
you know, I want to see the defensive line just take over because if they do and we can kind of get that any kind of production out of that position right there, man, we're going to be tough to score on. We're going to be tough to score on because this defensive backfield closes on the ball better than any defensive back that I've ever seen. And I, I know people go, oh, there's this one where we had five first-round picks and we had this. Guys, all these guys are going to play in the NFL. Every single one of these defensive backs is going to play in the NFL. But frankly, everybody in the two deep – is going to play in the NFL. This is a super, super, super high-end, talented group in the defensive backfield. And uh, if we get any production out of the front, if we can make it uncomfortable for the quarterback in any way with our defense, interior defensive line and, and our defensive ends, then this is going to be a virtuoso year for Ohio State defensively. Uh, we already know how good we're going to be offensively. We know how good we were last year defensively, but there's another level and and that that'll come right from the defensive line. So that's what I'm really looking for. Seeing those guys can take over, dominate the scrimmage. And if they did that and they made the offensive line look bad, that that really wouldn't hurt my feelings. Pass rush, yeah, from the edges. That's that's a great one. I think that we want more production out of the the ends. And I think Jim Knowles is going to turn them loose this year. So we're going to see a lot of production this year. Steven Luter, thank you for the deuce. Thank you for being a scoop ultra member as well. If you have a question, toss that in the chat. Uh, appreciate you, my man. Donald and Karen Rossback, thank you again. Uh, this is maybe the greatest idea in the history of Buckeye Scoop. Thank you for being Scoop Ultra member as well. During the Scoop get-together, everyone should go and look for Nevada's sign. Uh, Nevada OH. I O. So here's the deal. This is what we're going to do. If you go and find a photo of, of Nevada Bucks sign... And you take a photo of it, I will buy you a beer at Beat Ups. And I'll probably buy you two beers Ooh. because that's that's Ooh. actually a great idea. And by me buying two beers, I mean the Vatabuck will buy you two beers because he's the one that really wants it done. And he is into hiring mercenaries. So you can basically morph into being uh, the Mandalorian and you can go be a bounty hunter and go look. There's a bounty on finding his sign and posting a photo of it. So if you have it and you bring it up to me at the tailgate and you say, Kirk, I found Nevada Bucks sign. Uh, they buried it. Those henchmen, Gene Smith, and all those meanies in the athletic department. They buried it six feet under the uh, the hedge and whatever. Like whatever. Like you guys got to find it. You guys find it, and I'll go see if it's still there. So I even know if it's still there. Um, and if not, you guys could probably just do some funny Photoshop and put Nevada and spell it like crayon and Nevada's tennis building. You know, and I'd probably still buy a beer for great. Now, 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 wait a second. There's, there's two, there, now, just so you know, there's, there's two signs. There's one that's like a plaque that kind of sits at the ground, like a plaque, a ground plaque type of thing. So you can look down and try to find that one somewhere. And then there should be like a upright sign, like on a banner or something out there. So we got, we're looking for upright sign and we're looking for down in the ground kind of a plaquey kind of thing. So either one of those, those, those work. I think you're going to have a better chance finding the placky thing because that was that was pretty heavy, and I can't believe they completely destroyed that. That's got to be around somewhere. Oh, they, you know, they're they're scoundrels now. They might have taken it out of the ground, uh, especially especially after we hit thirty thousand subscribers on YouTube. That might have put them over the edge. That might that might have triggered them, honestly. Oh, I hope. I <laughs> that, I can I, I can I, I can. It'd be worth it. That would that would be worth it to lose oh, my side for that. Oh God. Uh, Damo, thanks for the five. When would you like the O-line to be set by? That is a great question. Are there any position battles that benefit more from ending earlier than others? I think quarterback, if he was, if there's a clear cut guy, I think it, you end it quicker and he can really become the, the number one guy. I think that's better. Um, O-line soon as possible. But I mean, the players are the ones that end it. It's not the coaches, the players end it. If you got to go out, play the guy and be consistent and be better. That's how you end the, uh, that's how you end the battle. So if Luke Montgomery wants to be starting right tackle, go pass him. George, George, uh, Fitzpatrick, I, I'm telling you guys, it's got to come down to who's the best pass blocker. That's what it always comes down to who makes the fewest mistakes, who can they count on? Um, you know, and a guy's going to go grab it. And, and again, like you can't, there's a lot. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of luck involved. You can't get hurt. You can't sprain an ankle. Can't have a bad, you know, hand gets screwed up, uh, shoulders bad. You got to gut through whatever because everybody starts to feel like trash after two weeks of spring ball, um, and you can't feel like trash. Like your your fifth practice has to be better than that other guy's fifth practice. So, I uh, 
I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be really good. Like, like, like I said, I, I love a competitive spring. Um, and, and, and honestly, like from a starting position standpoint, this is one of the least competitive springs I, I could remember just because we have so many guys that are basically locked into their roles, but the backups spots are ultra competitive right now. And I'm thinking of the corners, the safeties, uh, you know, linebacker, we got to find a starter next to Cody Simon, the backup D tackles, the backup DNs, uh, who's the third running back, you know, really we got to figure out who the starting. I mean, I would probably bet a decent amount. G Scott's going to be starting tight end this year, just because he's got a lot of momentum, but is he good enough to actually block anybody? Cause he didn't last year. Uh, so you got to find some guys that are actually, um, you know, can hold the point and, and help out the running game. Uh, you know, the, the receiver game, I mean, there's going to be some rotating between the top four guys and then the O line, you got to figure it out. So I'm, um, I'm really excited to see uh, some of these battles but for the O line. Like I'd hope by the middle of camp, you, you've got it set and you can just, cause those guys got to start building chemistry. You can't just be rotating them. Cause that was something that I thought killed them last year as they did these crazy rotations. And, you know, if you're not a guy that's ever played O line, like you don't understand, like, I don't want to play next to six different right guards. Like I want to play next to one guy get to know them, play with maybe two guys at most. I, I can't be playing left and right and guard and tackle and guard and center and both sides. And because you, you can't ever develop any sort of chemistry. It's just like, it's so different than any, every sport in the world relies on chemistry at the highest levels. You talk about football, basketball, uh, hockey. I mean, it, you have to know your, your teammates, your line mates, whatever it may be. Um, and that was something that I really uh, thought was huge. Like, I mean, when we, when we were really good in 2012, we started all five guys every game. In 2013, we started uh, all five guys. I think 12 of the 13 games, Alfline started the Michigan State game. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's really critical um, for the development of the offensive line, the team. Uh, you want to lock those spots down as fast as possible. But, you know, the players got to do it. So that's um, that's on them. Um, God, we just got a flood of Super Chats. William Jones, uh, thank you for the 20 Appreciate you, my man. Congrats on 30,000 members. Thank you so much. Again, that's all because of you guys. Uh, uh, Go Bucks and Nevada. Uh, your thoughts? William Jones, congratulations on 30,000 members. Again, big watermark, and it's all organically grown because we don't buy followers because that's something douchebags do. Yeah, no, that's definitely um, not something that we would do. But I, I, I said this before, but I want to say it again. It's really humbling the response that we get for this podcast and the fact that people show up and participate and are part of such a great community and um, are so generous and giving and giving of their time and their, their great questions. Um, it's just fun. It's just, it's, it's really, really fun. And it's super meaningful to both Kirk and I, and we tell you how much we appreciate it every night, but I don't know if you really know that, or if you think that those are just kind of like words or a script, or, but it's, I, I assure you it's not. Um, we really, really, really appreciate everybody and uh, look forward to building this channel, you know, bigger and better. But thank you guys so much. Totally, totally agree. Uh, Ohio 7715, a.k.a. Devin, a.k.a. Uh, uh, Cujo's uh, best friend, Cujo the Raccoon. Thanks for being an ultra member. Thank you for having that wrench. Uh, thank you for the 20, my friend. 2024, 2025, Natty Lock. What's up, fellas and family in the chat? New running back coach, Intel. Uh, Kirk, how excited are you for this year? Uh, Nevada, how excited are you to watch Scum fall? Nevada, OH. I O. Running back coach Intel has been very interesting. Uh, the DeMarco Murray thing we thought was done, and then DeMarco basically, I don't know if he played Ohio State or if they opened up the bag or, you know, I mean, if, if I'm DeMarco and I want to be the head coach of my alma mater, like, Brett Venables ain't looking too hot, so... If, if they gas Brett Vettels and he's done, then I think that the next man up is probably DeMarco Murray. So uh, they probably explained that to him. They gave him a bump. They gave him a three-year deal. Uh, and he's stuck there. So things changed. But that thing was hot and heavy a couple of nights ago. And then, uh, again, when when someone steps up with a bunch of money, things change. Um, but he wanted that Ohio State job. But uh, uh, there's the Stan Drayton stuff that's out there. That could happen. I've worked with Stan. I think he'd be a good hire. Um, there's a couple mystery guys out there, uh, that I think would be good hires. Um, but your thoughts, Nevada, on the running back coach Intel at this point? Yeah, no, it's been, 
I mean, I, I think it's been one of those ones where it's just been some weird situations. The, the DeMarco Murray one was was weird. The Stan Drayton, you know, I mean, you're in a situation with Stan where he's under contract at Temple for two and a half million dollars a year, but Temple wants to get rid of him. And Stan knows that Temple wants to get rid of him, trying to negotiate a negotiated buyout, but you don't want to just walk away from a two and a half million dollar job. So I'm not sure that deal can get made with Stan. I know that they both want to make it. Ohio State wants him. He wants them. Um, but that's a lot of money. That, that's not like a, oh, all I get some certainty over a contract, but you know you're going to get that money in the future. This is, if he walks away from the money, it's gone. And uh, it, not not to be made up. So I think yeah, that's a tough one with Stan. Stan Stan's the, the one, I, that's the one that I like the most. That's the guy that I would like to have have. I like Stan. Stan recruited Zeke. Stan recruited Bijan. Um so for me, that would be my guy, but I, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be McCullough. I don't know if it's going to be Blackwell. Um, at right now, I don't know. When we tell, we tell you when we know, we tell you when we don't know. I don't know. Just because there's so much uncertainty over these contracts and the contract, you know, contractual situations or where people are at. If it was just on who wants to be here, it would be Stan Drayton. Stan Drayton would be in here. He'd be in the job right now. He'd be coach of the guys. But, uh, you know, two, there's two and a half million reasons why he has to stick that out of Temple, and I'm not sure they can work that out. Um, they're trying to work out some sort of a negotiated settlement, but I'm not sure they're going to get there. So, so that's a tough one. Yeah, I uh, it'll be interesting because again, he, I'm not in the business of paying a buyout for a running backs coach because I just don't. I don't think running backs coach is that important. I mean, I think that obviously you want to have a good one, and they got to get a good recruiter in that spot. Um, because you know, a good a good recruiter is running backs coach is going to recruit your receivers, your DBs. Uh, he's going to be in a lot of urban areas. So you got to get a good recruiter. I mean, I take that more than coaching the position. I think that's more important. Um, but yeah, I think Stan's got a shot. So um, I'm very excited for this year, Devin. I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be, uh, this is one of the best teams we've ever had. And in, in, in conjunction with Nick Saban being gone, Jim Harbaugh being gone, like this is a, a road uh, that's been paved uh, a super highway to, to, to being great. So I'm, Really excited about it. Uh, Nevada, how excited are you to watch Scum fall? Oh, I, I can't wait for it. I, I can't. Them struggling this year is going to be beautiful. Um, watching guys leave in the second portal window is going to be glorious. Watching the NCAA hammer them is going to be terrific. Um, and uh, this will be my little segue. Our tight end room isn't great right now. <laughs> So Colson Loveland, c- c- come on down, man. We we could really use you because we need a premier tight end, and we don't have a premier tight end, right? Like if I'm giving you one report on this glowing report on all that all that is wondrous about Ohio State football in 2024, our weakest position is tight end. It is, and 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 that could definitely be an area that we go to the portal for a tight end. I'm sure there'll be tight ends you know, available in the portal. I'm not sure if Casimir, uh, the kid we got from Ohio, used more than just a guy. Um, we need a premier tight end and Michigan has one. So, uh, come on down. So you say they got to come out of the foxhole and go find some good tight ends. or they got to make Jelani Thurman a good player. Is that what you're saying? I, we, that is the weakest. It's the weakest position group on the field without, without question. I can't help but yeah. think he looks like glass Joe. I mean, I keep, I keep bringing that yeah. up, but like, I mean, if you guys have ever played super, the guy, the first guy you play in punch out is one in 99 with one KO. Uh, it just, it just, it just fits us absolutely perfectly. That might end up being a t-shirt. Uh, Philip Biaki, appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the 10. Thank you for being a scoop ultra member as well. So laughing at the image of Nevada buck wearing a horse head at his funeral and making you wear your Burke Carton jersey at the next OSU home game. Uh, I'm just saying like Nevada might do that. Cause I mean, you know, he might have the horse head on, um, with a, with a vodka tonic in his hand and a Oreo uh, strawberry milkshake and, um, you know, uh, his box DVD set of Game of Thrones. Like, that might be what he goes goes out in. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that horse said, you know, it was funny because someone in the YouTube comments said, you never did the Nevada look reveal. I was like, oh, yeah, we did. I remember it. And, you know, people were like, he's got a horse head on. Is he really a horse? I was like, I don't know. I've never met him before. So, uh, but now, to, your, your thoughts on... If I wear my, here's the deal. If you wear the horse head to the Michigan game, I'll wear my jersey to the Michigan game. So that'll be the deal. But I know you're not going to wear the horse head to the Michigan game, but it would be pretty funny. 
No, I'm I'm gonna wear a T-shirt that said "Scoop at it first just to troll everyone with that. And you you, got, you can bury me in that. So these oh. "Scoop at it first T-shirt just so, <laughs> so I have one. It's <laughs> like so flip off those guys one final time. Oh like, god. Uh, those those that tried to destroy me turned me into a radioactive monster, man. And I'm just <laughs> I'm not gonna be done until I kill everyone. So it's like oh, it's the best in the world, isn't it? I love it so yes, much. It is. It's yes, the, it is. <laughs> see you later. Thanks like, for uh, the do like for your super ultra member as well. Appreciate you, my friend. Thoughts on sprinkling in the triple option? I would love that. Um, generally, um, the modern triple option is done with a with a running back and a receiver. Um, you know, the RPO is kind of a triple option because uh, you know because that's that's basically what an RPO is. It's a triple option. Um, old school triple option. I don't know. Um, the biggest thing you want to do is you don't you don't want to put a bunch of hits on your quarterback, but uh, the modern triple option, where, which is kind of like the RPO game and and just some of the stuff where, um, you know, I don't know if a guy like Ennis could do it. Ennis could probably do it. I mean, Ennis could probably be that third guy that you would pitch it to, because uh, like when Urban did that stuff at Florida, it was just absolutely it would annihilate people with Percy Harvin as the third guy. It was crazy, but it's hard to get ready for, man. And I'm telling you, if there's one thing I love on offense, it's stuff that, that gives defense fits that they have to work on in practice. And that read option is that, dude. The read option is tough to get. If a team's good at it, really hard, uh, really, really hard to get ready for. Nevada, your thoughts on sprinkling in some triple option to the offense? I don't think it's a sprinkle. I think, it, it, I think that is a predicate of the Chip Kelly offense. He wants to have everything have triple option off of it. And that's how they're going to run it. And that's how they're going to present it. And that's how they're going to challenge the defense with it. So I don't think it's going to be a sprinkle. I think it's going to be a main course, and we're going to see we're going to see a lot of it. And that's why when we talk about the quarterback position, you're going to need a pair. You're going to probably need a pair and a spare because guys are going to take hits. Guys are going to go out there and be running the ball. Um, you know, when you when you can present a viable running threat with a Quinchon Judkins or a Trey Henderson running the ball or throwing it to a to a J.J. Smith or a Brandon Innes or a, a Mecca or whatever, and then a Will Howard or Devin Brown running with the ball, I mean, good luck. Good good luck good luck defending that. And, um, no, I think that's going to be a main course for the Ohio State offense this year. Yeah, and, and, like, instead of a sprinkling, it could be like the dude at uh... – at the Italian place, it has like the little the Parmesan gun with the little wheel thing. Yeah, and just keeps, lots keep it, of like, Parmesan piling yeah, up. Like that's what we yeah. that's how much triple option we want is just pile that stuff up. I think it'll be awesome. Um, Woody the historian, uh, thanks for the five. Appreciate you, my friend. Uh, Nevada OH I O. All right, with modern analytics, would Bo Schembechler <laughs> hire a little Geppetto to steal Woody's signs? Oh, oh absolutely, oh, Bo, oh, that oh. devious one. Of course he would. That's what Michigan people do. They cheat. They're liars <laughs> and they're scoundrels and scumbags. So of course he would. You know, I, but I don't think Woody didn't have any signs because he only ran like three plays. So it's not really that hard to you just gotta guess which one's right. But um I think he had the split end run the plays in back in the day or had the quarterback run over. So they didn't do signs back then and they didn't have headsets, so it was a lot harder to pick all that off. Plus they huddled. You know, which again, if you huddle, there's no there's no sign stealing because you're in the huddle and you know, they, they, they signal in the wristband and, you know, it's a lot easier to evade that kind of stuff when you huddle, obviously. Um, what do you think, Nevada, with modern analytics, would Bo Schembechler hire a little Geppetto to steal Woody's <laughs> signs? Yeah, I think Bo would have done just about anything to beat Woody. That, that was so competitive. But, no, nah, I look, that that was when the uh, the rivalry was uh, more honorable. And I, I, I definitely think that was a line that was crossed. And uh, it was it was out of desperation. And think we're, think about where Harbaugh was. Harbaugh was O for Ohio State. He was being, he, he was asked to take a fifty percent pay cut. I mean he, I mean he's basically going out on his shield at Michigan in disgrace. And I mean he turned it around with cheating. I mean th- th- there's no other way. He, he turned it around with cheating, and that gave them the confidence. That kind of kept their team together. Uh, because they were circling the drain. It was over. And I I'll, I will always believe that. I will always believe to like go into the grave with my scoop out of first t-shirt on that their cheating is what saved Harbaugh there at Michigan and saved kind of his legacy. It's still a tarnished legacy, but he got one with a national championship on it, but it was cheating. Um, and as you say, now a lot of this is going to be, you know, Ohio state is, is experimenting with the, uh, with the microphones and the helmets, which is kind of fun, you know, give the offensive guys one day, give it the defensive guys, but that's a whole new world now with, um, 
you know, uh, in helmet communication, that changes a lot of things and uh, you got to stay ahead of that as well. So, um, look, college football is changing. College, the college football this year is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen down to the communication on the helmet. So, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be like watching a, an entirely new product and I, and I, I'm, I can't wait to see it. I love that question. That's a great question. Uh, Roger Smith, thanks for being a scoop ultra member. Thank you uh, for the deuce as well. Highest impact Buckeye in 24 and who are our first round picks in 25 Nevada OH. I O I'll let you go first. Cause I don't, I don't want to pick your guys and, uh, go ahead and go first. Highest. In, who's your single highest impact Buckeye. Uh, and I'm assuming he means a player, uh, in 2024. Trey Henderson. I'm going with Trey Henderson uh, in, in the Chip Kelly rushing offense, the way Chip Kelly likes to use these guys, put them in favorable spots, get them favorable matchups, running quarterback to provide constraint, uh, better offensive line, better blocking on the, on, on the, uh, on the exterior with the, uh, with Chip Kelly demanding it from the wide receivers and the tight ends. I think Trey is going to absolutely feast. Um, couldn't happen to a better kid. And I think he's going to have an absolutely monster year. Totally agree with you. Um, I was going to go, God, I really want to go Caleb Downs. I really want to go Caleb Downs. I'm going to go Caleb Downs. Caleb Downs. I think he's going to be incredible playing safety. Uh, he's going to make a lot of big plays. He's going to run the show back there. He's going to be a leader. Uh, I'll go Caleb Downs. Uh, first rounders. Ooh, that's hard. I'm going to go Trey. God, I don't know how homerish I'm going to go. Um, I can see a Mecca getting back in that mix. He's got he's to bounce back a little bit. Uh, I could see Jack Sawyer. Um, I think Jack might actually end up going higher than JT. Um, Ty Leak is in that mix. Ugh. Denzel Burke is in that mix. Um, and maybe Quinshawn, Quinshawn Judkins. So um, I'd say three or four of those guys go first round. Uh, again, it's, it's all health dependent. Like it's easy to like pontificate, but you know, if a guy gets hurt, um, yeah, especially if he's had injuries you know, the last few years, uh, it can kind of drag his value down a little bit. But Nevada, your thoughts on who are first rounders in twenty five? Yeah, I, I, I think Trey and Quinchon are both first round picks. Um, I, I I think Jack will be a first round pick. I think Ty Lake will be a first round pick, and Denzel. Those will be my five. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, Woody the historian, thank you for the twenty. Uh, Nevada O H I O Modern Analytics. Would Woody <laughs> take punch a little Geppetto if he caught him stealing his signs? Bring the discredit for conduct unbecoming of an officer during the game and incompatible with the naval service. I mean, yeah, I mean he punched the guy that you know, the, the guy from uh Clemson, so of course he's gonna po- he's, of course he's gonna punch the guy that caught stealing signs. Of course Woody would have. Uh Charlie Baldwin. Uh, Charlie yeah, Charlie yeah, Charlie Baldwin. Yeah, exactly. I mean yeah. Nevada, I mean, you got to agree with me on that. Woody would slug, but he'd beat the crap out of that guy. Yeah, I think Woody would have grabbed like the yard marker and walked across the field and like just like bludgeoned him with the yard marker out there. If you saw that the guy was stealing his signs during the game, Woody absolutely would have gone over there and done violence on him. And I, I would have been there absolutely. for that. Would have been that would have been beautiful. I'd have loved every single minute of it. Uh, Woody, the story. Thank you for the five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean. He's, he's, he's right on the verge of being in the Hall of Fame at this point. If, some, no, 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 if, no, if somebody throws a question in there about who, 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 did, who did Rudy Rudiger replace for the Notre Dame game, then you get a free beer. You get no, a free beer. No, at, no, but, the... but, 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 but he's going to say with modern analytics, who did Rudy <laughs> Rudiger? That's going to be – that's going to be I – mean, you guys laugh. I mean, I'm not laughing. I'm dead serious. That will be a shirt on the next Buckeye Scoop drop. It'll say with modern analytics. That will be on the front, Buckeye Scoop. And then it'll say, if you know, you know. Uh, oh. What are you, the historian? Uh, Nevada OH. I O. With modern analytics, would Jim Harbaugh be too scared of Urban to hire a little Geppetto to steal signs? <laughs> I don't know, man. Har- Jim Harbaugh pretty strapped up now. I mean, I, I mean him, Urban, if Urban, him and Urban got into it, I mean, that'd be that'd be even money. And I think Jim might, I mean, that's that's a tough one now. I think Jim's a little bit, Jim might be a little, he's a little younger than Urban, played the league. He's a big dude now. Um, but Urban would give him a one four. I mean, Urban was raised by Bud Meyer, so he was walking home from little league games when he was five years old. And you know, I mean, Bud Meyer was a tough customer. Now, I mean, I heard some story. I mean, he told some stories about his dad, man. And I was like, whoo, 
No wonder it's like it was like the beat downs that his dad gave him. He had to give to the staff at Ohio State. And that's why guys like Sam Drayton ran for the hills because Urban was a big meanie to him. Uh, but hey, it worked. It made us really good. So I don't care. Um, but what do you think, Nevada? Would Jim Harbaugh be too scared of Urban to hire a little Geppetto to steal signs? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think Urban would have stood for it. I think Urban would have crashed. But when you're talking about dads, so we got to have the obligatory. Do we have John Simon's dad picture? Do we have that anywhere that we can get the John Simon oh, dad God. picture? Let me see if I can that, find that. Then we can put that up. But uh, no, I think, I think Urban, I, I just think that would have been glorious because I always think about when you, when they had Shiano on that halftime thing when he was just just dying to scream at him about the thing and the sideline reporter just like gacked the questions and wouldn't ask the follow-up question about what Shiano was so mad about um I think Urban would have just lost it because Urban had no filter that's why his press conferences were must see TV because he just said what was on his mind whenever it was on his mind so um I think that would have been glorious if uh, if Urban would have lined up with stallions across the way I think he would have he would have had a uh he would have had one of those like cyst aneurysms right there on the field. All right, I'm trying to get. Th- now this is a very blurry shot, but you can see how big Johnny Simon's dad's neck is because it is. It takes up the whole screen. <laughs> now that look, this looks like it's an eight bit Nintendo format. But hey, that is that is the biggest neck in Ohio State history. If anybody's ever walked through the Woody Hayes, that's that's as big as most of the the strength coaches and support staffs and general managers combined. If you measure that neck and then you measure all their little pencil necks, that is a neck. Johnny Simon's dad <laughs> did neck seven times a day in his house. And uh, he was a beast, man. I did not want to mess it, with that dude. It, it, was all, it was always neck day at the Simon household. Oh, you know, every day. Uh, if, you yeah. want your, if, you want your, if you want your spinach and your steak and your glass of milk for dinner, you got to get multiple sets on the neck machine. Load that thing up. Put all, take all the plates off the bench press and off the squat rack. Put it on that neck machine right now. Let's see and let's ride. Um, Mark Brown, thanks for bringing scoop. I'll show everything for the five Ohio refugee on the scoop. I love that. Uh, Leander, Texas via Canton. First time catching the show live. Appreciate you, my man. Uh, congrats on 30,000. Buckeye Nation strong everywhere. Nevada OH. I O. Yeah, Canton. Um, Canton is awesome. I love Canton. God bless Canton. Texas is uh, maybe more awesome. Texas is really awesome. So. Uh, I can't blame you. I think it's uh, it's a great place down there. Might be going to a draft party in Texas next year. Wink, wink. But uh, that that could uh, that thing's uh, going on. Kevin McQuaid, thank you for the ten. Uh, what's good, Kirk Diggler? Wow, that is a great nickname, Kirk Diggler. Boogie Nights. That is a <laughs> that that's a show right there. Um, make sure the kid for the, this is a family show, but make sure the kids are in bed before you put on Boogie Nights. That's a good one. Uh, uh, Kirk Diggler, Nevada, really massive. Again, make sure that when you guys say massive, it's in all caps. I don't care if you're doing uh, TPS reports at work or you're writing your thesis in college, make sure you spell massive in all capitals because that is how you do it. And that's how you get the maximum annoyance of people because everything <laughs> we do is massive. And again, that's why I love it. I, I mean, people get so annoyed by saying massive all the time that I put it on a t-shirt and guess what? We sold a ton of them. We sold a massive amount of them. So it was great. <laughs> um, uh, really uh, massive to hear you talk about Jake McQuaid. Fun fact, his dad and I share the same first name. Shout out to Carl Lugi. We watch the show religiously every day. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being a regular. Uh, Nevada OH. I O. Jake McQuaid is one of the greatest teammates. He was real young. I mean, he didn't play when I was there, um, but he really took off after uh, when I went to the league. He was a freshman and a redshirt freshman uh, in 06 or 07. Had a great career. He actually beat out Kyle Rudolph. He was a senior, and Kyle Rudolph was a first-round pick. Um, they played at San X together, and, and Jake McQuaid actually beat him out at tight end. Kyle was his backup, but Kyle Rudolph played you know, 10 years in the league and was a pro bowler and everything else. So Jake was always proud of that fact. But great kid, a proud ginger, very red hair. Uh, and a great long snapper. So he's made a fortune in the league and God bless him. Uh, can't take a, being a multiple time pro bowler in the national football league is very tall cotton. So I love that. Uh, Don Schaefer. Thank you for being a scoop. I'll remember. Thank you for the 10 Nevada in a previous life. You used to give us insights into the Nike big data analysis. What's the latest what's trending and what should we be watching for? And congrats on 30,000 subscribers. 
I know Nevada's source on this, and his source is a monstrous business guy um, who is very tight with Nike. Um, go ahead, Nevada. Is there anything on the Nevada Now or the Nevada, the Nike Now list? Yeah, no, the Nike Now list is basically the internal list that Nike puts out about stuff that's trending, kind of like the next big stuff. And they'll they'll put out stuff like, you know, you know, five years ago they put out that, you know, AI is gonna be like the next big thing or, you know, stuff, you know, trends that you wouldn't ordinarily be thinking about, you know, uh, you know, biomechanics or nanotechnology or they have stuff in music, they have stuff in fashion, you know. Um, and it's like I said, it's an internal document that's really reserved just for their higher ups at Nike. I haven't gotten it lately just because I haven't asked my guy for it, but I'm going to. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask me for it, and I just got to get around to doing it. Uh, as Kirk knows, my Nike contact is uh, is exquisitely high within the Nike organization, and um, he, he gets the stuff. I, I just got to ask for it. I'll get it, and I'll publish it, and uh, you'll see what Nike feels like are the next big hot things um, across the board, and it's it's always a good read. It's always interesting, and um, I'll, I'll definitely I'll definitely source that out. Yeah, I, I'll never forget meeting the guy, and and I was like, "That's the guy, really?" <laughs> and he's like, he's flip flops and swim trunks and a white tee. I'm like, "That's the guy. That's the guy that does all this stuff that you tell me about. He's got all these really cool things." And yep, that's him. I was like, "Okay, cool. Hey, God, I mean, he was he was a beast. Great dude, though. I mean, one of the." One of the coolest dudes I've met and an absolute monster, monstrous business guy. Uh, just get footage. Thanks for the deuce. Why is Jelani Thurman not being talked about at tight end? Uh, Nevada, I'll let you take this one first. Jelani Thurman should be talked about at tight end. Jelani Thurman is an absolute Greek god, like sculpted, you know, from the, from the mountains of, of what, whatever the mountains that the Greek gods came from. Um, and should be, uh, uh, he should be a much bigger impact player at Ohio state than he is, but he hasn't been. And yeah, you know, I, I don't want to turn this into let's pick on you know, who's our whipping boy coach now. Let's whip on him. But this is really, um, this is on the position coach to get the best out of the player. Cause you've got a, a kid with just unbelievable athletic ability. He's as good at, he's as good as he could be as good as any tight end that's ever played at Ohio state, but he's not. And, uh, for me, that's on the tight ends coach. They've got to get it out of him. So your question is the right one. Why isn't he? We ask ourselves the same questions every day. He should be the answer at tight end. And right now he's just a big question mark and it shouldn't be that way. Cause Jelani, Jelani could be like, like a, you know, stalwart in the NFL type of player. And we're talking about him as a question mark in Ohio state. And that's just wrong. Um, I hope it can turn around. I believe it can turn around. It can turn around. It needs to turn around. But right now, it's a big question mark. Yeah, I. Uh, and again, that's that's on the coach. It's on Keenan Bailey. I mean, you got one of the most talented guys in the entire team, and he's kind of in the mix. And I know he's young, but you know, you gotta you gotta expedite the growth process uh, as fast as humanly possible because he's the most talented guy in that room. It's not even close. But you gotta make him play like that. Uh, ZZM, thank you for being a scoop. Also, remember, thank you for the five. Is there anyone ready for us if we have both a top five offense and top five defense? We've rarely had both. Well, I mean, Georgia, Georgia, Oregon. I think Oregon's going to be really, really good. Oregon, Oregon at Oregon is going to be, that's going to be one of the hardest games we've played in a long time. Uh, they're really good. They've got a lot of good players in the portal. They got a good quarterback from Oklahoma. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to just go win that, go win it by one, one point. No style points needed to, to win on the road at Altson. They're going to be gassed up. It's going to be crazy, um, but yeah, like that. That's going to be a that's going to be a real one out there. So, um, but yeah, you know, I think you know, Oregon, Texas is going to be really good. Georgia is going to be good. You know, so at the end of the road, you get to you get down to the nitty gritty. Like you're going to run into some some real ones down the stretch. So, uh, but Nevada, Nevada, your thoughts? Is there anyone ready for us uh, if we have a, both a top five offense and defense? I mean, that's rare, rare. I mean, that, that, like you said, I, I'd have to go back to the record books and see when, you know, when we've had that, it's, it's you know, typically one or the other. You usually have the great offense and wish your defense is a little bit more, you know, resolute or, or kind of the other way around. Um, but this year, this is literally a team 
with almost, no, I mean, when your big question marks are like, who's the punter? You know, oh, the six seven guy from 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 Australia who's not there yet, incidentally, but he will be shortly. Um, or is our field is Jaden Fielding going to be able to kick a fifty yard field goal? Then you're really uh, you, you're really picking nit. So um, I I I think Kirk nailed it. I think you know Texas, Georgia, Oregon, who we're probably going to see at least twice this year is um, they're all going to be formidable. But it's it's going to be great. I'll put this Ohio State team up against anybody anywhere, anytime. And um, I like our, I think we'll be favored in every game and uh, I like our chances for the national championship. Yeah, I do too. I'm really excited about it. And uh, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta be lucky and you gotta stay healthy. And a lot of that's kind of tied together. Steven Luter. Thanks for the deuce. Doesn't this sound like, uh, doesn't this have a Joe Burrow LSU feel? Ooh, that's tough. I mean, cause you look back at that team and, you know, they have some ballers, but I mean, it it, it kind of does. I mean, I think the difference is Joe Burrow was in the offense for a year before. Uh, you know, he, so he had a full year of experience with with Chase and Jefferson, but obviously they weren't chasing Jefferson until that next year. Um, but you know, going into that season, like nobody thought LSU was going to be maybe one of the three best teams in the history of college football. I mean, but they were. Um, you know, and Justin Jefferson turned up in a big way, and Jamar Chase turned up in a big way, and. You know, I mean, it was, you know, when when they went to Austin, Texas and beat, you know, Tom Herman in Texas, like that was, that was looked at as like a, a good win, a good program win, but it wasn't like, you know, oh my God, this LSU team is amazing, but they kept getting better and better and they beat Alabama and uh, they just kept running through people. And, you know, now you look back at it and you're just like, God bless. They had Joe Burrow, Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase as their, like their, their, you know, their, their kind of battery. And you're just like, well, yeah, how could anybody ever check both those receivers at the same time with Joe Burrow throwing them the ball? Um, so it really comes down to the quarterback. I think that this entire season is going to, it's not about the O-line, it's not about the Will linebacker, it's about the quarterback. And if if Will Howard or Devin Brown can be that dude, then I think we win the entire thing. Because that's the biggest question mark in the room. Um, you know, Because if we had Quinn Ewers here, we'd be the unanimous number one going into the season. But you know, if Will Howard can be anywhere near as good as Quinn's going to be this year, then we could beat Texas. We can beat anybody. So uh, it's going to be exciting. And I think that's something that Ryan and Chip, uh, Ryan and Chipper is going to turn the heat up on those guys and develop them into, uh, you know, a, a premium Heisman finalist type uh, quarterback. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Does this season have a Joe Burrow 2019 LSU feel? Yeah, I, th- I think we won't, we will be not quite as good offensively, but I think we'll be significantly better defensively than LSU was that year. And, um, I think we'll have the best defense. I have no doubt we'll have the number one defense. In the country. I thought we would have the number one defense in the country clear far and away before we got Caleb Downs. And now that we got Caleb Downs, and I'm telling you, Caleb Downs is freaking good. Caleb Downs, I mean, I know that's like newsflash. Oh, God, you know, thanks, Nevada. Thanks for sharing that little you know, factoid with us. But he's really good. And, you know, when you, when you take a guy like that and you put him into a position of need, on a defense that's already super late. We were number two in the country last year in defense and returning virtually every key starter of the Mike Hall. And now you have Caleb Downs. I mean, so yeah, I think it's going to be LSU 2009, not, not quite as good defensively, but better off or excuse me, better defensively, not quite as good offensively. And I think a better team overall. So I, I that's why I think we're going to be the national champions. I totally agree. Uh, Alpha Maley, uh, where is good parking uh, on the Scoop Meetup Day? Anywhere around Lane and High is good. Uh, there's the Union Garage. It's a little bit of a walk. Um, there's some off the street parking. I'm gonna have to check that because I I usually um I usually Uber down on game days, uh, or you can park you know, around the stadium. I think that I think they open that up a little bit more. Um, but again, if if you guys park at like traditional game day spots, I think it's a little bit more. It's a little easier to get in and out of the spring game because they don't um. I don't think the lots are as restricted as they are during, uh, during the actual uh, regular season. But I'll get back to you on that. I'm gonna have to look at that because I know that um, campus can be a little tricky. But you know, the Union Garage is usually where I park because it's safe um, in general and it's it's monitored and secure and that type of thing. And it's probably a block or two away from from Buffalo Wild Wings, so that's where I'd park. Um, if I if I don't Uber, uh, I'll luckily park down there. But uh, I think I'm gonna be Ubering down. So, but I, I check that Union Garage and and scan any other garages because they've added a bunch of garages. There's a, there's a garage at the business school at Fisher college, uh, which is right next to the Blackwell. Uh, that's real good. Like when I was getting my MBAs parked there every night. So again, you, you know, there isn't 
lot parking, but there's a lot of parking garages nearby. Um, so that would be my optimal uh, solution. So uh, if there's other ones, and, and if anyone has anything in the chat or in the in the uh, YouTube comments, please uh, let us know around Lane and High Street, that little intersection, where are good places to park. What about it? This is a good show. Uh, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, any final thoughts as uh, March Madness is still cruising along? No, well, no, just if you're going to the spring game, make the, your tailgate at Buffalo Wild Wings. There's absolutely no excuse for you not oh, to yeah. go by Buffalo Wild Wings because anywhere you park, just walk to Buffalo Wild Wings and instead of tailgating the back of your Chevy Suburban or whatever it is, go to Buffalo Wild Wings, have a smash burger. If you wear your gear, you might get a free beer. If you have a picture of Nevada sign, that would be fine. And uh, But there's no excuse if you're going to the spring game for you not to come by Buffalo Wild Wings and say hello to, to, to Mr. Uh, Burt Carton and the uh, and the Scoop family because it's going to be a great time and we want to see you all there. Totally agree. Uh, we got one in at the buzzer. Steven Luter, again, thank you for being an ultra member. Thank you for the deuce. Uh, Nevada, over under on 2025 first round draft picks. I'm going five. I'm going five. five. I, 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 I think that's, I think that's a, I really think that's a solid number. And I don't think that's being like, Buckeye crazy or, you know, you know I, I think five's the right number. Yeah, I mean, Jack and JT were great at Pro Day yesterday, so that, that kind of helps. And that guy, I think, is going to do good. Ty, I mean, Ty Leak's a guy that could easily be a first-rounder. I think Mike Hall could go in the first round, which that might seem crazy, but, I mean, he weighed in at 299. We had a 4.7, and you see guys like Christian Wilkins and these guys getting $121. Like, these, these defensive tackles that can make splash plays in – pass rush and 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 have that twitch those guys get paid a fortune in the nfl and i think mike's gonna be much better uh because he's gonna play more in the nfl like in college he didn't play enough like he sat behind uh, uh jerron cage and teron vincent nice guys not good football players not guys that are hard to block like mike and tyler uh, sit behind those two guys was criminal last year and then this past year they played uh and tyler exploded did really well um but, you know, Mike, if Mike's durability can hold up, he's got a long, illustrious career in the NFL. So I'm super excited about that. Well, we can wrap this thing up. Again, we appreciate you guys so much. Thank you guys for all you guys do for BuckeyeScoop.com uh, and for our YouTube page. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also, click that little alert bell. Appreciate you guys so very much uh, for tuning in. This was a huge episode again tonight. It's because you guys made it one. Love kicking with you guys each and every night and bringing you all the latest and the inside info of what's going on at the Woody Hayes uh, and around Ohio State football. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Shout out to my Florida Buckeyes, my Southern Ohio boys, my North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Texas, New York. Uh, my man Glenn up in New York, killing the game as always. Uh, people all over Ohio, appreciate you guys so much for what you guys do. California, Nevada. Uh, and global, we got a lot of people watch all over the world. Uh, I've seen Taiwan, I've seen Dubai, I've seen all over Europe. So I appreciate you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, and again, that's why I get a kick out of where you guys are watching from. So I ask who you guys are watching uh, the show with and where you guys are watching at, because it's always fun to see uh, watching this thing grow. So as always, uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. Thank you, Scoop family. I'll see you guys tomorrow at seven o'clock. Be ready to rock. Uh, go Bucks. <laughs>